today. It's Mother's Day. We have a nice service plan today. First of all, I want to tell everybody, all the mothers that are in here, all those camels that are on the side, you can put your eye on one of them, and we can't fight over them or anything, but every woman gets a, uh, a candle. We've got some for everybody, and it's really a nice thing. I thought it was kind of a fun thing we went around and dealt with yesterday and stuff. So hopefully you'll find one that you like, and it's good. we got a nice service plan today. We're going to be talking about Rahab, the transforming power of Rahab. But right now, we're going to start with worship. So if we can stand together, we're going to start right now with a full familiar song called Forever. It goes like this. Thank you for everything, Lord. 
for everything you do. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Right now we have one called I'll Fly Away. It goes like this.
verses 1 through 10. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. We're going to be talking about that. We're talking about the transforming power of Jesus, what he does to us and what he does in our life when he comes inside of us and makes us be the people he wants us to be. What a transforming power it is. Right now, can we have our ushers come forward with time for our giving? And I pray you give with the whole heart. We're going to sing a new hymn to us, which is an old hymn, but it's one that we've been kind of adding some new hymns in here. This is one called, I Will Sing the Wonder Story. <laughs> I was lost. 
mountain, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through me broken arms around me, threw me back into his way. Stalks of flax, 
listening to the clamoring of soldiers as they approached. The soldiers interrogated Rahab, demanding, where are the two spies? Although very much afraid, she calmly responded, the men did, in fact, come to me. But just before you closed the gate, they left the city, and I don't know where they went. Hurry, run after them before they get away. Believing Rahab that the spies had already left, the soldiers quickly chased after them. Because of Rahab, it went off again. The internet did? Oh, really? You know, if it were for women in the Bible, not much would have got done. Very long and everything. And all of them. Yeah. It just went off. It's all right. Why did Never had it go off during church before. If it don't work, we'll just pass on. No internet. No internet. <laughs> Connected, but no internet. <laughs> well, we still are all here. We have each other. Mark here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, right now, okay, kids, are your excuse for Children's Church? That's okay up there. Everything. Today, everybody, we're going to be in uh, Joshua chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at more stuff like that. Your mic. Uh, Your mic. Mic. Oh, it's not on. Okay. <laughs> One thing after another, it is. It kind of, kind of goes along with the way my weekend was this weekend, I guess. Everything was kind of mixed up and everything. But today I just kind of failed on our Super Mother's Day joke, so I just threw a few jokes in there today. I'm not going to tell you, I'm thinking of a story, I'm just going to tell you a joke, okay? In the beginning, God created the earth and rested, and then God created man and rested, and then God created woman, and since then, neither God nor man has rested. <laughs> okay, that was, that's just a joke. I mean, but why do they say amen at the end of the prayer instead of all woman? Well, the same reason that they sing hymns instead of hers. Now we're getting right down there to the bottom. Of it. But it was really quick for me. I didn't have to spend very much time on it. Here's one more I'm going to give you. Little Johnny's new baby brother was screaming up a storm. Johnny asked his mom, where did he come from? He came from heaven, Johnny. Johnny responded, well, I can see why they threw him out. <laughs> All right. That's enough. Enough of that stuff anyway. Let's let's go to God in prayer right now. Let's do that. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the, your humor and everything. For I know you have humor too, Lord. And I thank you for allowing these certain things. But Lord, I pray that you would just make this service alive, Lord, and just take the message and just seal it to their hearts. Give them a, a message that they would really be able to live with and, and grow with, Lord. So we talk about this transforming power. Lord, I pray that they would relate it to themselves and in their ministry. And today, Lord, I pray that you open their eyes and hearts and minds and ears to receive this message. And I just thank you, Lord, for how you're working in our church. I thank you for the things. I wanted to hold up on the funeral I did on Friday. I wanted to hold up those people for my cousin and stuff that love her. And I pray for comfort for them, for they were shaken by it all. And, and I pray that you would just comfort all of them. And I'm just thankful to be a part of it, and I, I pray that you would just comfort them. But for the service today, Lord, I pray that you would just take this message and just make it alive and help people to know, you know, how much you love them and the wonderful, wonderful plan that you have for their life. And so again, Lord, we turn it over to you right now. We thank you, and we ask for all of these things in your precious name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, today we're talking about Rahab transforming power. Today I want to speak to you about 
the transforming power of the gospel, basically. And we're going to begin reading right there in Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, which you would read along with me. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out to Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into the harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither to night of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto them Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house. For they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were, they she told them. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I won't not. Pursue them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them in the stalks of flask, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gates. And today we're talking about the transforming gospel, the transforming power of the gospel. And we're going to see how this prostitute, this Rahab the harlot and stuff, this shady lady from Jericho, came to know Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. It's going to be a thrilling, wonderful, exciting story. Now someone has well said, and here's the first on your outline, I've got five of them in a row right there, bang, bang. Nature forms us. Nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Prisons try to reform us. And education informs us. Okay? But only Christ can transform us. All right? Now, we need to be transformed by the saving power of Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about this woman, Rahab the harlot. And I want you to be thinking about her desperate situation. Because she was a pagan living in spiritual darkness. She was a harlot living in sinful depravity. She was a Canaanite destined for sheer destruction. And she was a woman and desperately needed God to do something for her. And yet as we study the Bible today, we're going to find out that Rahab the harlot was transformed by the power of Almighty God. And such a wonderful transformation it is. And rather than being destined for divine destruction, she is spared and she is her household is no longer, uh, no longer is she a harlot anymore after this transformation. You're going to find out that she becomes happily married and that she end, ends up marrying, of all people, a prince of Israel. And no longer is she an outcast because she becomes part of the house and lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. She becomes an ancestor in the flesh of the Lord Jesus. And Rahab became, on your outline, the great, great grandmother of King. David. And remember, she wasn't a Jew either. She's a Gentile. And Jesus was born to the house and lineage of David. And so even though God was working with the Jews, he was working with people that admired the Jews' faith. And the Jews, if they would take somebody in and believe in their faith, God would take them too. And here is a woman that is transformed. And wonder of wonders and glory and glories when we read the Bible in Hebrews 11 where the Lord is listing all those great heroes of faith. When he talks about Moses and he talks about Abraham and he talks about all of those great heroes of faith. Guess whose name appears right there in the hall of faith? It's Rahab from the house of shame to the hall of fame. Ah, that's a pretty good transformation, isn't it? That's good. That's something pretty wonderful, don't you think? And I mean that God could take this Canaanite woman, a pagan, living in darkness, living in depravity, living with such a horrible, awful occupation, and change her and transform her and make her an ancestor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to the flesh. But the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is seen here in the Old Testament in this second chapter of the book of Joshua. Now I want to read to you in Joshua 2, 1 through 7, how the spies, the two spies came into the house of Rahab. And you see that Joshua was thought that it would be a good thing to send spies out, to spy out the land under Jericho that was destroyed before the judgment of God 
So these two spies, and it's not coincidence, it is not happenstance that they come to the house of Rahab. Now in the house was a sinful woman, a depraved woman, a woman who deserved the judgment of God, but there was still something different about Rahab than all the other inhabitants of the city of Jericho. She had a heart that was hungry for God. And what do I always say is that, you know, growth is seen by a hunger for the Word. You love the Word. That is what growth is seen. Do you ever never really known it that you have simply, if you would have looked at her, you would have said, oh no, there's this wicked person. She's a prostitute. And she's vile, a lascivious person. I want to tell you, dear friend, that God loves the deepest sinner. And here is a woman that loved, has loved of God. And here was this woman whose heart wanted to know God. And I mean, in despite of her depravity and in spite of her sin, she had a hunger to, her in her heart to really want to know God. And we see many sinners have that in their heart and life. We are going to see that in a minute, that here is a woman under deep conviction of sin. And here was a woman that knew she deserved the judgment of God. And she wanted the mercy and the kindness of God. That the thing that was so remarkable to me was that a city that was so vast, as the city of Jericho with all the homes in Jericho and all the people in Jericho, and that the providence of God comforted, confronted her with the gospel of God. And listen, it wasn't by chance. And I mean, I'm telling you that these spies came to this house and it was the providence of God that caused it. But I want you to know how the Holy Spirit works like this, bringing people to himself. And this is a picture of it right here. First of all, the Holy Spirit begins to work in the heart of lost sinners. And then the Holy Spirit begins to make circumstances and events and what we would call happenstance in a person's life. And I mean until this person is all softened up, until this person's heart is completely prepared, until this person's heart is hungry to know the gospel to where he is sick of his whole life and he wants to change. That is what the Holy Spirit is doing over here in the heart of a sinner. But then over here in the heart of a soul winner, the Lord is getting the soul winner ready too. And he's getting that soul winner ready. And so many times, many people think that this is just a chance meeting. They think it's just happenstance. But ultimately, it is God who masterminds the whole thing in the providence of God. And the lost person is confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to see what really happens all through the Bible, too. For example, just remember Philip. We've talked about him many times. God's evangelist in Samaria in Acts 8, where Philip was an evangelist, he was preaching in Samaria, and God was giving a great, gracious, glorious revival meeting, and many hundreds were being saved, but God the Holy Spirit, by his providence, said, go out to the desert of Gaza. So Philip left the revival meeting where he was an evangelist, and he went out to the desert, and at that same time, he was working in the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch, too. Remember Queen Candace's treasurer taking the gospel to all Africa? He was a very important man. Now, he was out there in the desert, and he was studying the Bible, but he didn't understand it at all. We need God's help. You know, that was so strange to us. And we say, boy, that was a coincidence. Well, was it a coincidence that Philip and the eunuch came together at that spot? I don't think so. It's not a coincidence at all. That eunuch came confronted with the providence of God. God sent Philip. Let me tell you another story, same way it happened. Remember Cornelius in the 10th chapter of Acts, and Cornelius was a centurion. He was an army officer of the Italian band, and he was a Gentile, but also he was a pagan. He wasn't a Jew, but Cornelius had a hunger to know God. Where he got it, I don't know, but it is called light. When you see the light, you have the light, and even though he didn't have the scriptures the Jews had, he had light. There was something shining in his heart. And you know, one night, I can imagine perhaps he was alone on sentry duty or something, and old Cornelius probably looked up at the stars and so, how did all of this happen? There must be a God. Oh God, wherever you are, I want to know you. And so God begins to move heaven and earth to get the gospel to him. And anybody that does that, he will move heaven and earth to get the gospel to you. And it's because his heart is being prepared. God sends Cornelius some angels first to speak to him, to work on him. And also God sends Simon Peter a vision at the same time. But then God gets Cornelius and Simon Peter together. And Cornelius is saved and he's born again by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it wasn't happenstance that God got this Jewish fellow, Simon Peter, together with this Gentile, this pagan. It was the providence of God. 
I want you to know that predestination has only to do with the person that is a believer in Christ, but the providence has to do with the circumstances. And the light lends to, leads to life for one of us that's seeking God in obedience. So when you're seeking God in obedience, that light is leading you to life. As you grab it all in, it's saving you. And I want you to think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the story where he's taken the journey. And the disciples, they went through and they all hated the Samaritans. And they were filled with racial prejudice because they hated the Samaritans so much. But the Bible says that Jesus said he must go to Samaria. Now that need was not geographical. That need was providential. He knew what God was thinking because there he met the woman, that woman from Sakaar, which she was just like Rahab. In fact, she'd been married five times and was at that time living with a man that was not even her husband. Now, you could have said, well, the Lord wouldn't care about her much. But the Lord cared very much for her to take that trip there to meet her. And Jesus Christ met her at noontime right there at the well. And that woman had a drink of water that she'll never run dry because she found the water of life from our Lord and Savior. You see, because in the providence of God, she is convicted and then converted and then confronted by the gospel of Jesus. And do you know why the Lord used these two spies as he did? Do you know why they were ready to give such wonderful and wonderful advice to Rahab, uh, the advice that they gave, because chapter 1 of this book of Joshua explains it, when they said, all that the Lord thy God has said, will do. What I'm saying is, they were available. They were available. And I want to tell you, you know, what God is looking for today is people not with ability. He's looking for availability. And then he'll take the things that you're not that good at and make you better than the other people. You know, he, God has a way of taking things that you don't think you're very good at and making you into something. And I know I can tell you right now because I never was going to be a preacher because I don't like to talk in front of people. <laughs> something happened, though, I guess. You know, so. <laughs> and that's what happened. I got really sick and God put his finger on me. I think it is. <laughs> but people... <laughs> People simply just say, well, Lord, if you're preparing someone else's heart tomorrow, if you want to use me, do it. Well, what some people think, that's happenstance, where we just stop for a cup of coffee, or when people think it's just a chance meeting when we pull into that service station, or what some people think is just coincidence on your outline is, number one, the providence of God that confronts you. Which means that you can say, oh, God, I know that just as you brought these two skies to spies to the house of Rahab, excuse me, God, you can guide my life in the same way if I surrender. And what God is looking for is some people to say, oh God, I want you to use me. Would you use me, Lord? And not only was the providence that confronted her. Now the second thing I want you to notice, not only the providence that confronted her, but I want you to notice on your outline number two, the evidence that convicted her. Have you ever wondered how a pagan or a Canaanite, a prostitute, how she could ever have such kind of a conviction with her life? I didn't mean that she would want to be saved because she did have a very deep conviction. Let me read it to you. I'm going back to Joshua 2 and let's read from 8 to 11. We stopped at 7. Let's go from 8 to 11. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And when you came out of Egypt, and when you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, we'll talk about that in a minute, whom he utterly destroyed. And as soon as we did, had heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, for the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven above and the earth beneath. And so we see what caused her to have this conviction? What caused her to know that God had given the Israelites all this promised land? What caused her to know that Jericho was a lost cause? What caused her to know that God was such a great God? Well, listen to her confession of faith again one more time. Let me read the last part of 11. For the Lord your God, he is the God of, in heaven above and in the earth beneath. Wow. I don't think she went to vacation Bible school to learn that either. Well, how does she know that? 
Well, I'll tell you how she knew. She knew it by observing the miracles that God had done in the hearts and the lives of the people. I mean, are you listening? We are talking about the evidence that convinced her. What was the evidence that was convicting her? On your outline, it was the miracles that God was doing for her people, which revealed God to them. Not necessarily the sea and all the stuff, but what was happening in the people. Look at verse 10 again. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. Now anybody that's read through Exodus and Genesis and also Numbers, and we see it even in Deuteronomy 11, that uh, Og and Sion, they were giants. In fact, it says in Deuteronomy 3.11, the hog's bed was 13.5 was feet long and 6 feet wide. They were scared to death. There were giants. And we've been getting reports on you. They said, we've got these spies out, and we know what God is going to do in their lives. You destroyed those giants, and everybody is fearing for their life because they ran everything around here. That's what convicted Rahab the harlot. And she believed on your outline that Judgment was coming for real because they said so. But you see, it's not the sermon that the spies preached or anything. It was the life of the people of God were living. They were living like they really believed it. It was a miraculous life that God was working miracles in their life. And they had heard how God was opening the Red Seas for them. And how God was defeating all the enemies. You see, ladies and gentlemen, on your outline, not only are we to be witnesses... But we are supposed to be part of the evidence as well. Have you ever noticed that God doesn't ever have you do anything? It doesn't work anything out in your life unless you take part into it too. I mean, God can do it without you. You can't do it without God. But God won't do it without you. And that's something that we need to remember as we get a little bit lazy on the things that we think God wants from us. But here we see she wanted to get right with God. But it wasn't a sermon that they were preaching. It was the life that they were living. And so we see here that God ought to do something in our lives, on your outline, that cannot be explained. You should have something in your life that you can't explain. There's something about your joy. And some believers wouldn't even be convicted if they're arrested for being a Christian. And people say that they believe in Jesus, but we know Satan believes in Jesus also. How is their belief different than Satan's? I want to ask you this question from this angle. What is there about your life that cannot be explained? What is it about the lives that we're living that when people see us, they say, Oh, the Lord God is with you because there's something different about your life. Is there? Well, we're going to want... That God that we have, if they do, if you do show it. And I want to show you something else. That I'm going to turn to Acts 2 for a moment. And it's that amazing day at Pentecost. And you know, we have people praying today. And I've heard them say, oh God, I wish we had another Pentecost. But I tell you, we don't need another one. We need to enjoy the one that we have. We don't need another Calvary. We don't need another Pentecost. But thank God for the power of Pentecost. Because that's what we need. And on the day of Pentecost, something miraculous happened to God's people in that first century church. And it was on that day of Pentecost when those miracles events were all taking place in the hearts and the lives of the people. And they were all amazed. And they were in doubt, saying one to another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Now, who were amazed? Well, not the people of God. You should not be alarmed at miracles and things like that. But the unsaved people were alarmed. And you see, what happened was this. Remember, there was 120 disciples, and they had all been together, and they were praying and asking God to bless their lives. And they were loving the Lord Jesus, and they were loving one another. And God, the Holy Spirit, ascended down with this miraculous power in the very place when they were sitting was filled with the sound of a rushing mighty wind, and there set upon every one of their heads a flame of fire, and they looked like human candles, and they began to stand up and preach the word of God, and it wasn't preaching, it was just glorifying God in his thing, and they were glorifying him in languages known to men, but not unknown to them, but meaning not previously learned. So they spoke in foreign languages, and it was amazing service, a supernatural service. Everyone understood 
not like tongues sometimes, where people don't understand, we're waiting for some interpreter to help us. And those people who came and looked around in Acts 2.12, they said, what does this mean? Well, here was something that they couldn't explain, and they were bewildered. And it was any wonder that soon they were finally asking that other question, the second question. Let me read it to you in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So often we want to do it before they have even seen in us anything that amazes them. You see, it's when they see something in you that they can't explain that really matters. I tell you, when they say, there's something about this guy I don't understand, what does it mean? Well, that's God working. And it won't be long before they're telling them how to be saved because of something special that you have. Amen? Amen. Yeah, but if they can't see any differences, I mean, we're looking just like the world, and we look like the world, and we talk like the world, and we're like the world, and we dress like the world. There's nothing different about us. And you know, I have to tell you many times, there's nothing in our lives that cannot be explained. We're not that different many times. Yeah, we're telling everybody that they need the Jesus that we have. <laughs> you know, one city said, if you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you better look a little bit more redeemed. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. You know, is there joy in your life? Are you acting like a Christian? I mean, you, are you, what, is, what does your life look like? What is the evidence that convicted her? What was it that struck terror into her heart? What was it? I say that she saw in the lives of the people of God that inspiration and that power of God that was inexplicable. I tell you that brought conviction to her heart. On your outline, that providence that confronted her was because God had some people that he could use. Are you available? And the evidence on your outline that convicted her was that these people have been transformed. They had had a Red Sea experience. They had the blood of the Lamb experience. They had had the power of God on their lives. They had all that power, and I believe that when people see this, they want to be saved. You know, it makes me think of a story. There was a pastor that preached a little church in a little southern town. It was a blessed church. The pastor had prayer meetings with some of the brothers every morning. God blessed that prayer meeting. And one day they got to thinking about revival for the little town. And one of the men said, well, I've learned the way to get revival in a town. You just take and get the meanest man in town saved. And they said, well, let's pray that God will save the meanest man in town then. Okay? Then they got to thinking, and they really didn't know who the meanest man in town was. Well, they decided to do some research, so they said, well, you go do some research, all of you, and then we'll come back here and we'll have an election. And they came back, and they got together, and they voted. And one man won, hands down, no question about it. It was unanimous that he was absolutely the meanest man in town. Now, this man was a very remarkable man. I mean, he was a man filled with racial hate. He was also a man that was a moonshiner and a liquor distributor. He was also a man that was really into gambling very deeply. And he was also a man that loved to get in barroom brawls and fights. And you know, he was also a man that was living with another man's wife. And I mean, at his own life. As a matter of fact, that woman that had just shot him and the bullet was still lodged in his hip, and it was because the doctor didn't feel like he could remove it for some particular reason, I don't know what. But do you know why the woman shot him? She shot him because she was jealous of his wife. He was spending too much time with his wife. So he shot him. That's the kind of people we're talking about. That's the kind of guy he was. He was the kind of guy that stole the hog out of the game warden's truck. But this is the kind of guy that he was. Well, one time the pastor had been by to visit him before. He remembered, and the prayer group had made, the, before the prayer group had made this decision and everything, he went by his house to see him, and his wife met him at the door, and he said, yes, this is best and such person there. And she said, well, he's in the back room with other men, and they're in the back room gambling and drinking moonshine, and they're cursing up a storm. And she said, I don't think it'd be a good idea for you to go back there, and so he didn't do it. The internet came on. <laughs> Okay, well, let's skip that story. No, I'm not <laughs> anyway, the prayer team decided that they would pray that God would save this meanest man in town. 
So those men, then, they began to pray that God would save this man and transform him. And the most unlikely man, who I said is in the worst condition, actually, than Rahab the harlot. Now, there was another man in that group of prayer witnesses, and his name was Al Cross. Al Cross had been the town's most notorious alcoholic. You talk about a drunkard. I mean, he didn't even drink at home. He would drive down to the tavern. He would put his paycheck on the counter after he got it cashed there, and he would drink until he would pass out and fall off of his stool. Then they would take him and drag him out and leave him outside. And they would just stick him under the eaves of the house or up under the gutter somewhere. What a sad state it was. What a sad thing it was for poor old Al Cross. But Al Cross got converted. He received Jesus as his personal Savior. Well, actually, this pastor was the one praying with Al when he received the Lord. He said, you'll never have seen any kind of a transformation like this. Now, Al Cross had all kinds of different stories from his life. And he used to, said, I used to go away for cures. Now, folks, I'm not against those that are in for those going away and working at them and stuff. But Al said, you know what they did for me? He said, I used to go away a dumb drunk, and I came back an educated alcoholic. He said, it didn't really change me. He said, they told me all about it, but I didn't have the power to do anything about it. And then he said, one day I received Jesus Christ, and I tell you, he had just had a wonderful testimony. He, re he really did. But anyway... Al went to see this meanest man in town first, and afterwards, then the pastor went by to see him again. Now, the pastor walked up to the house and then remembered that they prayed for him, and he knocked on the door, and no one, no one, not knowing what to expect or anything, he was thinking, because he's a mean man, and the pastor was welcomed in with a smile. He went to see him, and the pastor said, well, sir, I'm not going to beat around the bush. I have come to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ and about being saved. And when the pastor said that, he looked right into the pastor with all seriousness and earnestness, and he said, Lord, he said, God, if God could do for me what he did for Al Cross, I'd do it in a minute. Isn't that something? Just as friend, the person that was changed more than the miracles or anything. But that is a miracle. Why don't we have as many miracles? Because the great miracle is our transformation, transformation of ourselves becoming to the people and having the right attitudes and knowing what we, what we need to know to come close to him. Isn't that something, though? That was the meanest man is down, and you know, the pastor said when he came to Jesus, it was like leading a little boy to Jesus. <laughs> he was gloriously saved, and his life was transformed, and he went on to live with the Lord Jesus Christ, and his life was different, his wife was different, his family was different, and his whole life changed. That was the meanest man in town. Well, what was the evidence that convicted him? Not some sermon from the pulpit. It was that he had seen in the heart and in the life of Al Cross, a man that he knew. He saw something of the power of God, and it was something that he couldn't explain. <laughs> Our world, on your outline, is not waiting for a definition of the gospel. Our world is waiting for a new demonstration of the gospel. Do you understand? Our world is waiting for an army or a generation of people that will rise up and live transformed lives. And you can say, what kind of miracle can I have? Well, I'll tell you, how about learning to return good for evil? How about another good one, wouldn't it be? How about learning to love those who despitefully use you? How about turning the other cheek to show kindness and let the love of the Lord Jesus Christ flow out of your life, all right? Because you see, the providence that confronted Rahab and the evidence that convicted her Finally, I want you to see now on thirdly on your outline the confidence that converted him. The confidence that converted him. You see, she was saved not by works, but by faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 that it was by faith that transformed this woman's life. Look what it says in Hebrews 11.31, Donald turn there. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. You see, her faith was not of her good works. Her confidence in Almighty God, and that is what converted her. She had confidence in faith in Him. In Joshua, too, she is talking to the spies, and she said that, I know that your God is the true God. Let me read it to you in Joshua 2, 12 and 13. It says this, Now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my Father's house and give me a true token. 
She's making him hold the promise, just like we hold God to his promises. You can't make God promise something that you want him to do, but if it's something that God has already promised to do, you can hold him to that promise. He wants you to. He wants you to have that confidence. And it says in 13 that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And he said, okay. Look what it says in 17 through 21. It says, and the men said unto her, we will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come unto the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house home, household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. He's going to protect whoever is in that house. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. That means if they told on them, then, then the oath is over. And she said, according unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. What was a scarlet line, anyway? Well, these men had gone down the rope outside in order to escape, of course. And Rahab says, no, look, I want to be saved. I want the mercy. I want your blessings. I want your kindness of God upon me. And they said, okay. But if you want God to deliver you, you take this scarlet rope. It's not a thread. In Hebrew, it says cord. Now, in King James, it's a thread or a line, but it was a rope that they could climb up and down on. You take this scarlet line and put it in the window, and when the Israeli army comes against Jericho, everyone will be told when they see that scarlet cord in the window, they're going to skip over that house. And everybody in that house where the scarlet cord is is going to be safe. Listen, what does that cord, scarlet cord stand for? It stands for the blood of Jesus, doesn't it? The blood, that's what it stands for, the Old Testament picture of the blood. And these Jews have been told her this, and they had told her all their experience, and the experience of Passover. And the Lord said that, you put that scarlet blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the house, and when I see that blood, I'm going to pass over you. And now for you, Rahab, this scarlet line was to be to you for like it was for us. What the scarlet blood was to them, because it spoke of the blood, and just as the Israelis passed over Rahab's house, Likewise, the death angel passed over Israel's house at Passover. And all of it is speaking to the blood of the Lamb. So she was able to take part in an illustration that would go ahead and put her in tune with the idea of the Lord Jesus Christ dying for us. The Bible says on your outline that Christ, our Passover, is his sacrifice for us. And again, here is the Old Testament picture of redemption by the blood. There's only one thing that can redeem us all, and that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's word says this on your outline. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And what was it that transformed Rahab the harlot? It was the blood of Jesus you say, wait a minute, Jesus hadn't even died yet. But I tell you, the Bible says in the heart and the mind of God, Christ was slain from the foundations of the world. And Rahab the harlot was saved on your outline by looking forward to the blood of Christ. Just as we are saved by looking backwards to the blood of Christ. God only has one way of salvation, and it is the blood-sprinkled way. And there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and did you know what the blood did for Rahab? On your outline, not only did it deliver her, but it transformed her. It wasn't just judgment that she escaped. She became pure, virtuous woman because morality evolves in this eternal, abundant life that God gives. It evolves. Have you ever noticed you know how far you've come until you really actually have to look back and go, oh, I guess I was, I guess I have grown. <sighs> because you don't know until you stop and look, though. Because sometimes we get so close to the trees, we can't, I mean, so close to the forest, we can't see the trees. And also she became the great, great grandmother of King David. And though Rahab may not have understood it all at that time, because I know that I didn't understand it all when I came to Jesus, I was blind. I didn't know very much about being married until I got married either, you know, but you find out when you do. Get with them. 
And I had a hungry heart, like her, like Rahab. And I tell you, there was a lot I didn't understand, but I do know that he who has begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good thought? He's working on you. And the same gospel that transformed Rahab so many years ago is the same gospel that's transforming me today. That's predestination. Predestination is working right up to the day of Jesus Christ because he's working on making us just like him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to tell you that I want to thank God for the blood of Jesus. And, and I, and that I thank God that he died and went through all that agony and everything and shedding his blood for us and stuff. But I want you to notice something different about Rahab the harlot. On your outline, not only did she confess her faith secretly, but she confessed her faith outwardly and openly. And because Jesus died on the cross for us publicly and openly, he wants you to confess openly. We cannot be ashamed of Jesus. He did it that way. He told us to do that. That's why sometimes when we come to the Lord, it's good to let other people see you. It's good to do it publicly. It is. And she hung a scarlet line in the window, not in the closet, outwardly, openly, publicly, unashamedly, there declaring that this is a house that's under the blood. Hmm. Under the blood. Every Israeli had put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes and on the outside where everybody could see it. Have you ever been ashamed to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Ooh. I mean, have you tied a scarlet cord on the window? When they see it, I know it's not when I wear my Jesus shirt downtown. <laughs> I got a cord hanging outside my window. And Jesus said, if you, on your outline, if you're ashamed of me before men, when I come in the glory of the Father with the holy angels, I'll be ashamed of you. Or I'll be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of the Father and not with the holy angels. And I want to tell you that he is coming, dear friends, and I hope that you have a scarlet line tied openly and publicly when God's angel of judgment comes, and he's coming soon. I know he is. We look at the news, and we can see something is about to happen. We know. We don't know the day or the hour, of course, but we know the signs of the times, and he said, you will know. When the storm comes, do you not know by looking up? Well, that's the way the signs of the times are, too. Don't you have a feeling that he really is coming soon? Yes. Do you have a line tied in your window? Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. And when judgment comes because you can have crisis at any time. Judgment is coming and surely it will come. But do you have a line in that window? And I'm asking, is your home under the blood? Are your loved ones in that home under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you told them about the blood of the Lord? Do you know that your family is truly saved? And you say, well, I don't know why I have to make such a public show about it. Well, I'm glad Rahab didn't say that, because she's Jesus' great-grandmother. And I'm glad Rahab didn't say that. Makes me think of another story about this old revival meeting about a lady that was deep, in her deep conviction. And some of the brethren saw her in the back, and she was crying. And they went back to witness her, and they invited her to come forward to the service and confess Jesus Christ as her personal Savior and Lord. But she said through her tears as she shook her head, she said, No, there's too many people. I, never, I don't want to do that. Uh, can I be saved back here? And they said, No. If you want to be saved, you have to come forward. Well, I know what you're thinking, but I'm not finished. But they said, No, you can't be saved back here. So the next night she came back, and she was under deeper conviction. And they went back and spoke with her, and she was crying. And she says, oh, I want to be saved, but I'm so timid and everything. Can I be saved back here? And they said, no. Oh, so the third night came, and she came back. She was there, and her poor heart was about to break. And they came back to her and says, gee, lady, won't you come and confess Christ openly and publicly as your Lord? And do you know what she said? She says, Okay, okay, yes, I'll do it. I'll do anything. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. Just let me have peace with God. And they smiled and said, well, you don't have to come to the front then. You can, you can say it back here. You understand what I'm talking about? I'm talking about what is in her heart. You see, we must come to that point of total submission. How many people say they believe? And you think they believe by watching them? No. So if you believe, you should look like it. You should act like it. If you're redeemed, act a little redeemed. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me and my word in this sinful, adulterous generation, I will be ashamed of you when I come in the glory of my Father with the holy angels. 
And I want to tell you that the faith that will not lead, on your outline, the faith that will not lead to confession will not lead to heaven. If you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. But the scriptures say on your outline, whoever believes will not be ashamed if you really believe. If you really believe. One last word and then I'm finished. Now there's some of you who are thinking, now pastor, what are you saying? Is all right for a person like Rahab? She needed to be changed. But not me. I've never done all the bad things she has done. I'm not a harlot. I don't do all these things. I'm a cultured person. I'm a good person. I have nice manners. I have good morals. And I don't need the gospel. I don't need this kind of a giant transformation. But do you know what Jesus Christ said when he was on this earth? Jesus said, looked at the self-righteous people of this day who thought they were okay. And he said, Tax collectors and harlots are going to get to heaven before you. Because at least they know that they're sinners. That's one of our most important things. That we're sinners. And we need to be saved by grace. And of course, the spiritual man that has the Lord doesn't sin. But the thing is, we are working on our souls to be like our spirit for the rest of our life. And they will call upon the Lord to be saved. And all that have sinned have come short of the glory of God. And they need a Savior. They need salvation. And I want to tell you because the worst form of badness is not prostitution. The worst form on your outline of badness is human goodness. When it becomes a substitute for the new birth. Oh, you're that good. You don't need the new birth? <laughs> God has said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And it was the blood that saved her for all eternity. But not only that, it was the power of the blood that transformed her into abundant living, which is so important that if there was no heaven or hell, it would be important to have Jesus in our life so we might have the power and the spirit of God in us to guide us and guard us and protect us. What a wonderful thing it is. But we do have heaven. We do have eternal life. But it took her from the house of shame to God's hall of fame. And so we can't help but thank God for Rahab and the transforming power of the gospel. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. And I pray that it touches our hearts, that they might have this message to seal to their heart, Lord. That they might grow in predestination and become like you, knowing how important it is and how God is always making a way. Sometimes it seems, Lord, that... Uh, God isn't working, but if we have faith, we know that God's timing is just different than ours and that he is truly working it out. And if you cling to the promises of God and know that he's working in your life and know that you're being obedient to his word, he is doing something. He is doing something. And he's working a miracle out in your life. And I pray that God would guide us and guard us through everything that we go through. I pray that we would pray every day and seek him for all decisions and help us to know that he's watching us and he's with us all the time. Lord, we love you and we thank you again for this opportunity to share your word. And I pray that you would just bless these people really good, Lord, and help them to understand how important it is to have you in their life. And so again, Lord, we turn this service and these people over to you again and ask for all of these things. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, right now, I don't think somebody heard my bell. If my bells didn't work right upstairs, it would be part of the weekend. That would sound weird. They're not working up there. So thank you, Danda, for, for going and get her. She likes me to have her come down the same last night. Sometimes I start ahead of her and she couldn't wait for me. <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> so it's so nice to have everybody here. Mark, I'm so glad you came today. It was nice. It was really nice to see you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. You have a really good friend there. <laughs> Is she coming? I I would Well, she's pretty special here too. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're going to go ahead. And I'm going to pretend like she's almost here. She is. Here we go. Let's stand together. We got one last song here. Sing it with me. With all my heart, I.